So we're going to jump into this now. When should I refer a child for a special education evaluation? So I knew that this probably would be a topic that you're really interested in and thinking about as general education teachers. Um, today's content I'm really going to try and blend because I know none of you are directly responsible for eligibility determination, so you are not conducting special ed evaluations, but you're part of, part of a special ed team, right? So your special educators, you call them in when you have concerns, maybe when kids are continually scoring low on the AIMS web, and you're really seeing that this child is not developing or learning at a rate that you think is appropriate based on other children in your classroom. So tell me some other reasons that you refer children for special education evaluation. Um, parent told me that they're not seeing, like, they'll give them a task at home and they're not able to mm -hmm. accomplish that specific task. Excellent, Megan. Yeah. Yeah, so if a parent has concerns, absolutely a child should be referred for a special evaluation. In fact, it's part of our law that if a family has concerns and they request an evaluation that we need to follow up and conduct an evaluation. What are some other reasons you're seeing in the field with specifically with English learners that really you start to feel like you need to refer them for special ed evaluation? No Low academic performance, right? So you think, well, after a while in the classroom that they would be mastering certain skills in literacy or in math, and you just feel like the learning curve is not happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, so here, exactly. So the child's not making progress as you would expect. So based on other students you've worked with, based on other English learners you've worked with, maybe they're just not making adequate progress. Um, the family has some concern. The child scores in the low range on those curriculum-based measures. So you're giving the AIMS web and they continually are scoring, scoring at the bottom of your class. If the child has low English proficiency, the child um, also has concerns in a more dominant language and not just in English. So when you're conducting those assessments in school, I think the critical part here is that I know the Ames Web is pro probably only in English. Do any of you do any native language testing? So testing in Spanish or other languages? Brigance. The Brigance in Spanish. Oh, great. <clears throat> um, but I know, again, once they hit school age, again, we have early childhood and there's a more attention to home language. Generally speaking, once they hit school age, you're just conducting all of those assessments in English. So what you need to be careful of is that you don't end up referring them that their low scores are not just a reflection of their low English proficiency, um, because in that case, really, you can't know whether that's a, a, a difficult or a deficit they have or just a language difference, right? And so they might need more time in your classroom to be able to learn more English to be able to perform on those tests. Our English learners in the school system have a really impossible task. They're in the process of acquiring English while also being um, asked to learn in English, right? None of us could really do that. Could any of us go to Russia tomorrow, take a college course, right? You're just in the process of learning Russian, and suddenly you have to learn new academic content in Russian. But every day, English learners face that in our school systems, and not only that, we assess them and judge them on a language in which they're not yet proficient. So thinking about today, we're going to talk, you think, I want you to start already thinking about some problem solving techniques you can use when you're using those English only assessments with those students to really understand if it's about a deficit or a need on their part, or really they just need more time to master English before we assess them um, in English. So I wanted to go over the 14 categories of special education, just so you knew a little bit more about our system. How, how many of you feel really confident and feel like you understand the whole special ed system? No. <laughs> I've worked in the field for 17 years, and I still am like, oh my gosh, things change, laws get rewritten. So I want to give you a little overview of what are we even talking about? What is a student with special needs? How do we identify them? When you're referring them for an evaluation, is it some magic formula somewhere that we're comparing them to? So just to give you a little bit of background information. There are 14 <clears throat> categories of special education. Each one has its own criteria. Okay, so I'm not going to go over all those, right, that's a whole course, that's stuff we teach when you go to graduate school for special ed. But today I'm going to show you a few different um, of the criteria so that you can just start to understand the kinds of things that your special education team are looking for when they're conducting those assessments, okay? So we've got autism, blindness, deafness, emotional disturbance, hearing impairment, intellectual disability, multiple disabilities, orthopedic impairment, other health impaired, sometimes ADHD can fall and beat that category if it affects educational performance. Specific learning disability, that can be in literacy or literacy. Uh, speech and language impairment, uh, traumatic brain injury, visual impairment, and developmental delay. And this is the category we use up to age seven or eight, depending on the state, the state laws are. It's six, so it's six here in Nevada. Um, and developmental delay 
is the category we use early on because we're not really diagnosing a disability. Instead, we're saying there's a developmental delay that could lead into uh, a disability. And it's the one area in special education where we serve students that are at risk and, and aren't necessarily diagnosed with a disability. It gives us some freedom early on to provide early, in, early intervention to children who are scoring low on standardized measures, but we don't yet have to say that they have a disability. Right. So here's a uh, criteria that Nevada State, so last night I was looking up Nevada State criteria for, <laughs> for special education needs. Um, so, yep, you're right, it is under six, that's right. And then they have to have a delay of at least two standard deviations in one, or at least one standard deviation in two or more of the following areas. So we're doing conducting developmental assessments. And who knows what I mean by standard deviations? What's a, isn't it like grade levels, like two below? Nope. No. Okay, that's <clears throat> mm -hmm. Here's why I want to explain this, okay? Because I think this helps you understand why our processes with English learners can be difficult and complicated. Because often the test that when we have a norming sample for a special education evaluation, there's a certain population in the U.S. that they're being compared to. Well, those populations and those tests, generally speaking, are monolingual English speakers. They only speak English. And so when you're using that child's performance on that test and comparing them to a sample that they were not included in, then the comparison doesn't work and our standard scores do not work. So when in the special education criteria, it says that they need to score one standard deviation below or two standard deviation below, those average scores are set primarily by children who grow up speaking English and grow up only speaking English. So by nature, children who are in the process of just learning English, right, are going to score low. They might score at one standard deviation below or two standard deviations below the mean, but not because they have a delay or disability, but only because they're in the process of acquiring English and will not score like a child who's spoken English their whole life, right? And so that's the risk with special education is that the tests that we use are comparing those children to to um, English speaking children instead of to children who have grown up speaking the language other than English and are in the process of acquiring English. <clears throat> so for specific learning disabilities, most of you who work in school age, by and large, this is where children get referred, right, to the SLB category, where they're having difficulty reading or in numeracy. Now again, with uh, learning disabilities, we're looking for those discrepancy models, right? A discrepancy model, so you, uh, Nevada still uses a discrepancy model where you get an IQ test and the student scores an average range in terms of IQ, but then you give them an academic achievement test and the achievement test is low. So then it, the way the law is written is that, well, IQ-wise, their ability-wise, they should be performing at a typical level, but there's something maybe about their learning processing, their auditory processing, their ability to um, use, um, their, their ability to express their um, knowledge and literacy or in math is, there's something going on there, and then they end up qualifying under certain learning. That's by and large the largest category that English learners end up qualifying under. And when you look at the data across the US, English learners generally in about the third grade, there's a real upswing in the amount of English learners that end up being referred for specific learning disabilities, particularly in the area of reading and particularly in the area of reading comprehension. So why do you think that might be? Could you respect that again? Sure. Yeah, so um, in about the third grade, English learners, uh, we find in, in data across the US, there's, um, there's a real increase in the number of English learners that are referred for special education evaluation, particularly in the area of specific learning disabilities in the area of reading, and particularly with an emphasis in communication or uh, comprehension, reading comprehension. So why do you think that might be? Third grade, a lot more referrals. Is it because the, the curriculum is getting more difficult for them? Yes, that's definitely part of it because up until third grade, we are teaching to read, but then about the third grade mark, children need to read to learn. Okay, so that's one part of it, absolutely. Why else do you think that might be thinking about reading comprehension as an area of need? What skills do you need for good reading comprehension? Talked about those last week. Vocabulary. Yes, yes. Deep knowledge of vocabulary. You need not only breadth of vocabulary, but deep knowledge of vocabulary. So why might that be difficult for English learners? Well, there can be use of figurative language that they don't understand, idioms, 
metaphors, all that. Exactly. So part of it's that it's decontextualized, right? And the whole focus of this is on academic vocabulary, right? So it's one thing to have social vocabulary, but it's another thing to bring a deep knowledge of academic vocabulary to the reading that you're doing in classrooms. By and large, those are textbooks, right, with specific vocabulary associated with them, which is why this whole project <laughs> is focused on academic vocabulary, because it's one of those areas of real deficit of English learners and leads to higher uh, referrals for special education, again, in the area of reading and specifically in comprehension. So what we do in the U.S. is we do a great job of teaching decoding, right? Students can sound out words, they can, uh, they're able to read fluently, but if you ask them what it means is where the breakdown happens because we haven't done a good enough job of teaching background knowledge and academic vocabulary for them to really access the content that you find in academic te texts in the classroom. And again, about third grade, that's when that real shift happens, and you're absolutely correct, um, out there in the field, um, that, uh, that that's when there's that emphasis is on reading to learn versus learning to read. So think about that for those of you who are preparing students, kindergarten, second grade, and in third grade, how to really build that vocabulary and that background knowledge that they need to be more successful in reading. Because reading isn't just about decoding, it's about understanding what you've read. And then I just put up there autism as one of the categories, but we can move on. So let's talk a bit about the recommended practices for um, the Division for Early Childhood. Again, these are very similar to the recommendations in See, and I just pulled a few out here because there's a myth in particularly when working with uh, students with special needs that somehow you need to choose one language or another, right? That it might just be too difficult for them to master two ling languages. Well, that's a myth in the field. Uh, students with special needs can absolutely learn more than one language and our national councils now have embedded in our recommended practices to make sure that we are addressing um, dual language learners needs both in their home language and in English. So the first area I'm going to start with, I just pulled out a few of these recommended practices, um, not all of them, uh, but in assessment, practitioners should use assessment materials and strategies that are appropriate for the child's um, age and level of development and accommodate the child's sensory, physical, communication, cultural, linguistic, social, and emotional characteristics. So when we're using assessment materials, we need to make sure that we're looking at any cultural biases that might be in those materials and making sure that they're linguistically appropriate. Now, what gets difficult about that is that we don't always have assessments in languages other than English, particularly when you're working in a system and you're using just the curriculum-based measures and you only provided those in English. But it would certainly be something for you to consider in your school systems to maybe use, remember Doris Baker was here? Well, she developed a measure called the EDEL, which is a Spanish version of the Dibbles. And so certainly early on in grades K through three, we should be looking at those kids who come in who are primarily proficient in Spanish, doing some of those assessments in Spanish early on versus What was it called, the Dibbles in Spanish? The Idel, um, the Indicadores Dinámicos et Éxito de la Lectura, I think is yeah. what they are. Yeah. <laughs> so Idel, I-D-E-L. Um, could you give one example of what cultural bias looks like? Yes, I have a great one, actually for the Brigants. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, I was uh, I doing some consulting. When I lived in Utah, I started, I used to work at Utah State University before I used to move to Oregon. And I had many state grants there for years in a row and I was doing technical assistance. And I was working on Navajo reservations in the southern part of the state. Now, primarily on those Navajo reservations, children are learning English as a first language. Um, it's uh, some Navajo reservations, they learn Navajo, but in this particular area, they're primarily learning English. And yet, and they were using the Brigants as an early childhood screener, and they were having like 85% of the children being red flagged as having special needs. So they're trying to figure out what's going on. 85% of these kids do not have special needs. So it's something about the test we're using. So I, was, I went down and looked through their test, I was giving consulting on their testament or assessment process and the materials. Well, if you look at the Brigant's language section, the pictures, the images that you use are very urban. And so those kids had no experience with the images that were being like fire hydrants and these big brick buildings and, you know, other materials were just that they had zero experience with that. They were living rurally, uh, sagebrush, mesas. <laughs> um, so the, the children just didn't have the vocabulary to complete the brigands in the way that it was written. And yet they had all this other knowledge, right, their own cultural knowledge. And so we started to develop uh, more like vocabulary lists and interactions um, to, to 
double check the brigands results that were more based in their culture and what they knew from their own environment. So that's an example of cultural bias and how it can really red flag children who it's just a difference in experience. So just to add a little bit more on to what mm -hmm. I'm saying is that children's um, background knowledge, which yes. they use when they're looking for their um, participating on these kinds of assessments, and when children don't have the background knowledge, that includes vocabulary, because vocabulary doesn't represent a word, it represents a broad network of concepts. They don't have those network of concepts in their framework, and so they're going to answer in ways that are <clears throat> incorrect. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Children can only know what they're exposed to. Right, <laughs> they're not out there seeking new opportunities. <laughs> reading the New York Times, you know, <laughs> they can only know what they've been exposed to. All right, A five. Uh, practitioners conduct the assessments in the child's dominant language and an additional language if the child is learning more than one language. So we're going to do a lot of talking today about specifically those kids who grow up speaking more than one language. Maybe they're speaking English and Spanish in the home, or English and Vietnamese in the home. That maybe we need to do testing or at least do some sort of assessment level of assessment in all of the languages that they speak because they will have skills that are distributed across those languages. And we're going to talk more about that. Um, practitioners should use a variety of methods, including observation interviews to gather assessment information from multiple sources, including the child's family and other significant individuals in the child's life. And this is where I really think the K through two or K through six system needs to catch up a bit to speed and get back out there and involve families in these processes in meaningful ways and conducting strong family interviews and making sure that they're part of the process and they have an opportunity to comment on their child's development. When we look at instruction, um, practitioners provide instructional support for young children with disabilities who are dual language learners to assist them in learning English and in continuing to develop their skills through the use of their home language. Right? So again, in schools, we tend to have the subtractive model. They come in the English only, and there's very little support, if any support, for their home language development. And I'll tell you another reason why that's problematic. In special education, we're supposed to be giving evaluations in the child's dominant language, right? Because we don't want to qualify a child for special education simply because we gave them a test in English and they don't speak English yet. Once we qualify them, we've used their home language, what language do we deliver intervention in? English. So we identify a delay, a deficit, a need in home language, and then we proceed to educate them in a language that they don't understand. <laughs> makes no sense. It's the state of the system that we live in right now. So I think when you look at our national organizations, they're trying to provide more guidance to tell us we do need to have more uh, uh, native language support in our school systems by hiring bilingual paraprofessionals, um, by finding more bilingual staff to deliver intervention, particularly reading intervention in the child's native language. Um, there's cross-linguistic transfer of skills between Spanish and English that we could capitalize on and make those bridges. So in any way in your school systems and your areas, if you have some influence around that or thinking about hiring aides or other um, staff, it is important to provide native language support. It's an evidence-based approach to provide instruction. Uh, practitioners use and adapt specific instructional strategies that are effective for dual language learners when teaching English to, ch to children with disabilities. This is another area where we fall short in that we use the same old, same old, right? So children who are learning English as a second language are just tossed into our classrooms with very little support for their English language development. How many of you feel like you differentiate instruction for the English learners in your classroom? So tell me some strategies you use for the English I'm very big on TPR. Okay, great. Right. So do you want to tell what folks Oh, what so here? total physical response, so mm -hmm. gestures, correlating, um, you use whole brain teaching, so just making sure that there's a movement that correlates with whatever verbiage you're using. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's one way is acting things out, using gestures. What are some other ways you, you could differentiate for English learners when you're instructing in English? <laughs> and folks from afar, you could chime in too. Wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I do speak Spanish, so I'm teaching vocabulary, I just help in Spanish. I mean, it's not like a strategy that an English-only teacher could do, but it's something that I Right, and using your Spanish intentionally to create these bridging opportunities is a very appropriate um, instructional mm -hmm. approach, as long as you're not code switching, right? Enter in a sentence and modeling a code switch utterance. But if you're strategically using their native language to provide definitions and more information, um, then that's an, that's an effective use of it. Mm -hmm. 
language. And you could deliver whole uh, lessons in their native, in Spanish, right, that are then going to prime them and prep them for a lesson that you'll do in English. Mm -hmm. uh, identifying topics. Great. Um, also, like we just received um, a lot more professional development on um, providing sentence frames mm -hmm. based on um, levels of English proficiency, mm -hmm. um, like differentiated. So, like, be a level, you know, one to two, with mm -hmm. their um, language will be very different than um, the language level of a Vita five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So when you're looking at the WIDA, so what you're alluding to is that you know the language proficiency of your students based on actual testing, and you're able to adapt your English language instruction to their level of proficiency. Excellent. Yep. And so all of what you're talking about gets embedded in this one little standard here, right, that we use when we adapt our strategies, but too often we walk into classrooms and that's not necessarily happening. And from what I understand of this project is you will become trainers of, you will become leaders in your district, right? And thinking about, and I think this is one of the main areas that you could emphasize when you go out into training and talk with folks, because even if they don't have bilingual staff, absolutely we need to be doing more adapting when we're teaching in English and differentiating instruction to make our, our instruction in English more effective with this population. And going back to what Chantel was saying, but really thinking about their English language proficiency and using that information to guide instruction. I have a quick question. I'm sorry, it's just burning my brain. And so it is. So why do you think in the field um, teachers often do not differentiate instruction? What do you think are the obstacles? In cases that say we don't have time to create differentiated instruction. Okay, like lack of time. Lack of time. What else? I, I think a lot of teachers assume that they'll just pick it up. Okay, mm -hmm. there we go. Immersion, you know, are they just like, oh, they'll get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and actually there's a great article. It's called the common myths of uh, dual language learners and that's one of the myths, right? They'll just pick kids learn language like a sponge, you know, <laughs> it's like it'll stick them in it and they just absorb it. Now, while children do lang learn language very quickly um, and are amazingly resilient within the environments where we provided <laughs> very little support, the fact of the matter is, is that we lose children by not providing scaffolded support and we're not as efficient with our instruction because we're not being scaffolded. And given our topic today, we certainly need to pay more attention to those students who are at risk or have special needs because they will need high quality and targeted instruction in order to be effective with it and, and be successful within school environments. Otherwise, those are the kids that will fall absolutely through the cracks, right, that, that are coming in potentially with some special needs or learning impairments. Can I ask a question before we move on? We were talking about DD students. I don't yeah. know if you're going to talk about that later, but often in pre-K or kindergarten, they're, um, they're determined to be DD, developmentally delayed. And then when they come to me in first grade, and clearly there's still some big gaps, then they retest them and say, well, they no longer meet the criteria. And so they're exited from special ed. And then we have to start the process all over again most times. <laughs> Yeah, that is a tricky, it's a sticky wicket because when you look, that's why I brought up that eligibility criteria because the eligibility criteria as you go through school gets more stringent, right? And so you have to have further deficits in order to qualify for services. So a child who would qualify for developmental delay, once they hit that age and they have to meet the other criteria, may not uh, may, uh be able to be eligible based on that criteria. So really special ed is a wait to fail system. It's not a preventative system, right? And it's one of the faults, right? There are many kids that are in that gap where you know they need extra instruction. They're basically your tier two kids who need extra instruction, need extra support, and are yet not at two standard deviations below the mean, right? And so for, for special <laughs> education services to kick in, we basically have to wait for them to fail, which is really unfortunate. On the other side, in the general education environment, using more response to intervention, we all, yeah. Um, so really differentiating instruction within the general education environment has to start um, really um, being where those children are provided those services. Because in reality, if they are provided more high quality services and targeted intervention with ongoing progress monitoring, differentiation, hopefully that they, they won't end up qualifying for special education needs. But this is a really important population to have a strong RTI system in place so that we're catching those kids before they fail. So my question was, uh -huh. is I was under the impression 
that RTI, that, that RTI was adopted, number one, to be preventative in nature, and then to give a, to maybe not necessarily eliminate the discrepancy model, but it be another, um, if students are not responding to intervention, um, kind of their next step. That's 100% correct. So RTI started out as a general education initiative, not a special education initiative, to number one, um, catch kids before they fail, right? And to put some onus on general education to differentiate instruction within general education classrooms before we refer for special education. And two, um, to get rid of the discrepancy model because it is an ineffective and inaccurate model for identifying learning disabilities, right? Because there are plenty, there are plenty of problems with IQ tests to begin with, right? Um, and particularly with populations such as English learners, because again, those IQ tests were normed on English monolingual speaking children, English um, and mainstream culture, children from mainstream culture in the US. So, and then also when you have that discrepancy model, um, the only thing that you're looking at in that discrepancy model is you're putting that deficit on that child, right? You're saying, well, their IQ is here, their aptitude or their academic achievement is here. So that gap must be something about their ability to learn and RTI, that model for identifying learning disabilities, really hones in on, well, maybe it's the instruction <laughs> that they're receiving isn't meeting their needs, and that's why there's a discrepancy. Maybe it has nothing to do with that child's actual learning potential, but has to do with a lack of quality instruction. So the RTI model, in order to identify learning disabilities, in many states they've gotten written, and now that's why I looked at Nevada state criteria, you're still one of the states that has the discrepancy model. Other states have completely gotten rid of the discrepancy model and the way for identifying learning disabilities is based in RTI and you have to have tried at least two interventions over a certain amount of time and collected data and they were not effective and then you go down the learning disability route. But you have to document that you've tried something different with that child and you've collected data and shown that it hasn't worked. So that's the difference there. But Nevada is not a state that is it's part of your criteria yet. But that's a state level decision. Yes, that's a state level decision. The criteria, states have the option to still use a discrepancy model or to use an RTI model for diagnosing or identifying learning disability. Thank you. All right, so yes, he's using rehearsal strategies. Can everybody hear me now and see me? So I'm going, okay. All right. Um, when does he begin to use Spanish? Exactly, right? So he didn't just immediately start using Spanish because she was speaking English to him. We're going to learn about this concept called interlocutor sensitivity. And it's just a term that, um, a technical term for uh, bilinguals know when to use each of their language with different communicative partners, right? And that develops really early on. Little Edwin knows that she's speaking English, she's speaking a language he doesn't understand, and he's not just going to bust out and use his Spanish because he knows she's not going to understand that, right? And so when we talk about these stages of second language acquisition, when we talk about that initial silent period, it's really a time where children are trying to crack the code because they have interlocutor sensitivity. They understand that that person is not going to understand them if they use their native language. And so of course, if you have no, no way to communicate, you are going to go through a silent period while you're learning enough English to be able to use some lang uh, English language expressively. But for those of you who speak Spanish, does he understand some English? He does. He has some receptive ability because she says, you know, her bulldoze, yo busca una escuela. I look for one at school. It sounds like he says afuera, but the mom says that it's school. He looks for one in Yeah. Or no, wait, the other way around. He said afuera, he said her school, but it's escuela, afuera, the rear school. So basically, but he answers the question appropriately um, in Spanish, even though the question was asked in English. So this brings up and is a good example for why. If I was going to do a special education evaluation for Edwin, what language would I use as a dominant language? 100% Spanish. But would it be important for me to do some sort of informal assessment in English to figure out what he knows? Absolutely, right? It doesn't mean I have to go through a full de de uh, the tell development mental inventory of him in English, but I might do a little book reading experience with him and know for the understanding. I might go through a routine and play some Play Doh with him and say, hey, pick up this, do this, and see how many hands he responded to. Um, I would think of some informal process where I've used um, data gathering to figure out what he knows in English and where I might be starting with him instructionally in English. Because remember, my going back to my initial comment, 
Edwin, 100%, and most, almost 100% of schools in the U.S. would be affected again. We come to that level, but what level, what kind of, what language are we going to be affected? English. And if we don't do something in English, we don't really know where we're beginning with next in English. And effectively, for a child like Edwin who qualifies for special education where we prefer to deliver services in English, we're becoming English teachers for a while <laughs> until he's ready for actual intervention in English. If we develop intervention with um, Edwin in Spanish, we might be working on more nostalgic vocabulary, increasing his being of other senses. Examples of where we might present with we can do all of that in Spanish. But in English, he's working on just some expressive like by a common object, right? Being able to teach he's at different levels in Spanish and um, English. And when we're thinking about him, this is a good example of why we need to look at both languages and what he knows. So, what is bilingualism? To be bilingual does not mean a person has to speak each language equally well. Each language can be used in different contexts and for different purposes. Many children will have different degrees of bilingualism based on how long they've been exposed to each language and the quality of that exposure, right? So it's not just how much, but how intensive has the input been? Um, what is the quality of that exposure? Being instructionally exposed to a language is different than just being socially exposed to a language because of the form of the language that's used, the vocabulary that's used. Um, so there's differences there. All right, so simultaneous versus sequential bilinguals. I asked you before how many knew the difference. So someone tell me what's a simultaneous bilingual? Someone who's very, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, go for so it. It's learning two languages at the same time. Right. And then sequential is learning one language before the other, not simultaneous. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. Yep, so simultaneous at the same time. So there are many children in the U.S. that have native languages, right? So it gets us away from the idea of what is your native language. There are many children who grow up speaking two or more languages as their native language, right? So we can, in fact, have more than one native language. Sequential bilinguals are those students or children who learn primarily one home language, and then generally speaking in the U.S. are uh, introduced to English at about the age of three through some early uh, learning program. Head Start, home visiting, special ed, something that happens around the age of three, child care. Um, and that's considered a sequential bilingual. So they've had a foundation in one and then add English as a second language. So some key factors of bilingual development, when you look at the research, young, primarily this research has been primarily been done with middle class populations, uh, particularly from French um, or from Quebec with French and English, but they reach generally speaking the same linguistic milestones as their monolingual peers. So we don't have evidence of just being uh, bilingual somehow delays your linguistic milestones, but you need to look across both languages again, right? So say a child speaks German and English. Well, they'll have some vocabulary in German that they don't have in English, and they'll have some vocabulary in English that they don't have in German, and so we need these total vocabulary scores. So when we used to think that somehow children were delayed because they were bilingual, we would just look at one language and compare it to monolingual norms, right? So we just look at say their English and say, oh, their vocabulary is low. Well, they have this whole other range of vocabulary that's just stored in a different language. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to look at both of their languages using this idea of conceptual scoring. So looking at the concepts that they have, um, and again, looking at the words that they have in each vocabulary, the words that they share across their languages, Young bilinguals demonstrate what I talked to you about, this interlocutor sensitivity. There's really interesting research in that area that even as young as 18 months, children will switch their language based on their communicative partner and be able to do that with high levels of accuracy, right? So that would be an area where that would be a red flag for a child if they continue to use a language that their communication partner did, un did not understand, right? That would, that would be a red flag because usually kids, just like Edwin, he couldn't be more clear, right? When she asked them a question, he's like, <laughs> Um, and so you, that shows me that Edwin actually has really good pragmatic skills. He's really trying. Um, also, that repetition that he's doing at the end of her words is also a good pragmatic skill because he's trying to continue the conversation. He knows that she's expecting something. And so that shows that he really is, he's trying to keep that engagement going even though he doesn't have the words to use with her. Um, children will have that are simultaneously bilingual have an abundance of translation equivalents. So they know the word dog and perro, gato and cat, depending on their context. But 
children don't duplicate every experience, so they'll also have vocabulary that's unique to each of their languages, and certain words don't always exist in other languages in terms of the content or the construct that exists. And these are called singlets. So they'll have vocabulary that's unique to each of their, um, each of their languages. An example that I've seen a lot in the field after 10 years of doing early childhood assessment is that if I was giving an assessment in Spanish and asking colors, que colores, and everything else was happening in Spanish, the kids would answer in English, red, blue, or I'd be asking letter names and they would answer in English. Why do you think that would be? Their parents might have been teaching them some of those skills in English, the parents thinking that they needed that content in English and maybe not their home language. Mm -hmm. And then also if these kids were like, say in a Head Start setting, Exactly. So there's le they're learning those concepts in English, and so they only have the English word for it. So even, and so here, this points out something really important when we're looking at delay and we're assessing kids in their home language. Because when, even if you're using a Woodcock Johnson or say a Dial or a Battelle, and you get to these academic concepts, and you're using their native language, but then they're answering in English, and so maybe on the standard protocol, you have to score that as incorrect, right? Well, they actually have that content, but they've mastered it in another language. Um, and so there's even the risk there that they will score low in their native language because they haven't had access to academic content in their language. And that's another uh, difficulty with assessing them only in their native language is that you might miss some of the academic content that they've been exposed to in English and now only have those concepts stored in English and not in their native language. Does that make sense? So it's very complicated. These are not, these are very nuanced issues around the assessment and eligibility determination um, with English learners and special education needs, given the way that our school systems are set up. Um, because in, in some ways we create these deficits and these differences in knowledge because of our English only approach. So now we're going to switch and talk about um, the article that Duran G. Santos evaluating young children who are dual language learners and a process uh, for conducting special education evaluations. And I hope through that, that you're also able then to apply that to some of your general education evaluation processes. Or if you're sitting on special education teams with students that you've referred, you'll know what to advocate for, what to think about, and the kinds of information you need to make a, a, a strong decision or a high quality or evidence-based decision around eligibility for special education. So I really love this quote because it really gets at the heart of the issue. The knowledge, sensitivity, and care of the person giving an instrument and interpreting the result is ultimately more important than the specific tool that is used. Technical adequacy does not assure an unbiased assessment, right? So it's the special education team that determines eligibility. It's not just scores on a test, particularly when our tests are so faulty and we're comparing these kids to norms that really don't apply to them, right? Remember we talked about our norms here being average on monolingual English speakers, and so there's flaws in the way that we give tests, and so we need to make sure that test results aren't the only ways that we're determining special education needs. So right now, um, in groups of four or five, or however you want to group, I want to know in your school districts how you go about determining special education needs. So think about special education teams you've sat on, um, EL cases you've sat on. What was the process for determining whether or not that child had a special needs? What kinds of assessments did you use? What kinds of resources did you have available so that I'm aware of that? Um, and so I'd like you to think about that and maybe some questions you might have left that process with. All right, so basically when you're coming up with an evaluation plan, and one of your assignments following this will be to develop an evaluation plan. So you're, you have the data on your child in terms of the language background. You're going to develop a child profile and then just come up with an evaluation plan. I know that none of you are responsible for eligibility determination, but certainly as contributors to our team, you can help develop the evaluation plan. So when you're coming up with an evaluation plan, again, just to keep this in mind, this directly now relates to the assignment that you're going to need to do. You need to think about number one is how will the family be actively involved? How did we gather information about this child's development in their home language? Are they functioning at home? Are they functionally using language? Um, do they have any concerns about their articulation of sounds in their native language? When I lived in Minnesota, I was working in Mankato, Minnesota, 
there were kids who spoke Oromo, Anuak, Noor. These were uh, refugee communities that had been relocated to rural Minnesota and were from the Sudan and from Somalia. And within those region, within that region, there were all sorts of um, African languages represented in the populations that were coming. I had no idea what articulation was in Noor, right? I had no idea what sentence structure was in Noor. So I really had to reach out to those families. So I know you're dealing with more languages than Spanish and you might have more resources and uh, supports for Spanish, but certainly if you have children speaking other languages, then you need to reach out to that family and say, do they sound like other kids in your life, other siblings, peers, cousins, other people, so that you can get a better understanding. Again, a child will not be just delayed in one language, they'll be delayed in both. Then uh, next, um, where and how will language observations in the child's natural setting be conducted? Now in early childhood, that would mean like home environments, that would mean uh, Head Start environments, that would mean childcare environments. Uh, for school age, that could be playground, right? That could be lunchtime. That could be, obviously you can't leave a school building and go do a conduct an evaluation of family's home. That's just not the freedom of flexibility we have. But certainly you could get outside of the classroom a bit and see how they function and communicate with peers and how well they're just using the language generally. Um, how, wait a second, there we go. Well, how will the team determine the child's level of language in both their home language and English? And we've, both been, we've all been discussing this, right? And this gets more and more complicated the further you get up through school because if they've had most of their instruction in English and a lot of their academic content will be in English and they will be at different levels of English proficiency. But number one, look at their WIDA test scores, right? If you're using WIDA, see when's the last time WIDA has been given, if you feel like it's an accurate reflection. Um, children's language proficient proficiency, particularly K through three, can rapidly shift as they're being exposed to more and more English. So if the testing's even a year old, I might suggest redoing it, right, just to see if they've grown in terms of their language proficiency, because that can change pretty quickly um, with the more intensive exposure to English. And then their home language, if you don't have a way to assess that, again, you need to reach out to the family and at least get some anecdotes from the family about their use of their home language and whether or not they feel it's appropriate. Or if you do have bilingual staff that you could call in and do some sort of informal activities with them around book reading or some comprehension strategies, again, based on their developmental and their grade level, what would be an appropriate informal engagement in a school setting to gather some information about their home language so that you don't miss their ability. Here's mm -hmm. a quick question. So mm -hmm. when we think about anecdotal mm -hmm. information that one can get from a family, these are informal sources mm -hmm. of data mm -hmm. that we can refer to. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples of anecdotal um, information that's useful to get like from mom or dad about child language usage? So um, whether or not they feel uh, if the child's using complete sentences, completing thoughts, do they functionally communicate their needs, right? Are they able to request items? Are they able to request needs? Um, are they able to come home and explain to them what happened that day during school? Can they complete a story with them, some sort of narrative about an event that happened that was uh, decontextualized outside of an immediate experience? So those are some of the anecdotes that I would ask families to report on, um, is how they're using language functionally. Can they communicate a story that has some linear, uh, time elements in it and whether or not they sound like other children and peers because we could have kids with like articulation disorders in other languages right and you just can't know that if you don't speak the language but certainly the parents would pick up on those kinds of articulation or sound errors uh, over time. Mm -hmm. Um, how will the team locate and train an interpreter? So some of you will, on your school buildings will have interpreters that are readily available that work with your teams, but if they're more low incidence languages or you don't have interpreters, then finding some systematic way that you do go about locating interpreters. Again, I've worked in these rural uh, communities in Minnesota, and I brought up earlier one place if we had languages that we, you know, Oromo, Noor, Aniwak, uh, Somali, other languages that we, well, Somali, we had a larger population, but certainly some of those other ones, we went to the clinics because often they were finding interpreters because medical professionals had to be interpreting for those families in the community. And the court system was the other place where we found interpreters for other languages because they had to provide legal um, services and in court they had to find interpreter services. And sometimes, you know, we were in a rural area, we'd call up to Minneapolis and we had some resources up there through interpretation services. So 
we had to get creative sometimes and think outside of the box to make that happen. Now again, I know it's a funding issue, so with special education, we'll often provide the interpretation for the meetings, right, because we need to get informed consent, and that's the number one priority, that during eligibility meetings, we absolutely need to have interpreters present for families who do not speak English, so that they, we can actually get informed consent from them, but this is another layer. If you want to find out something about that child's native language, you might need an interpreter there to do some sort of, again, you're not going to be able to do a Woodcock Johnson in NOR, but you might need an inter interpreter to tell you um, to administer some of those items on the test to at least report on how the child would perform on some of those items. I have another quick question. So when you're dealing with speakers of languages or even circumstances mm -hmm. where there is no interpreter, are there out of the box kind of individuals? I'm just trying to think of out of the box thinking. Are there other individuals that legally one could um, rely on their ability to interpret? Um, well, you can like individuals in the community. Yeah, you can just hire individuals in the community as long as you provide them training, and that's what often ha happens. It's just individuals with no interpreter training okay. that we end up hiring. Because I know that some cities are still learning about Las Vegas. Um, I've met someone here who was a community guy. These are individuals who help immigrants to um, help immigrants to um, learn how to navigate in a new school, how to navigate in a new city. And so often they have some um, informal, like they're not called interpreters, but they're people who can be relied upon for mm -hmm. interpreting mm -hmm. um, different things. So many cities, and I in Clark County, in one of those meetings there, I did someone who has that role, but mm -hmm. she's a community guy, that's what she called herself. She's a community guy. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there are other individuals um, from the community that we could rely on for assistance with the interpretation. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the, inter like I said before, a lot of the interpreters that we do hire have no training and aren't certified interpreters. They simply are people in the community that can show up at that time and fulfill that role. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then thinking about what assessment tools will be used and what other data sources will be used. All of our assessments are going to be imperfect in this situation, but thinking about what battery of assessments your school district already uses, and then what kinds of um, information will you gather about their native language with ass assessment. So again, the pitfall, like say with just translating, the, when I say Woodcock Johnson, do you, do you know what I'm talking about? I, I, Okay, so the Woodcock-Johnson is an achievement test that we use for um, diagnosing or looking at learning disabilities. And there's reading, there's math, it's a lot of academic content, and it's one of our primary instruments that we use in school-age populations for diagnosing learning disabilities and identifying them. Okay, so and that primarily is what's used across school districts when they're giving those eligibility determination assessments. Now, what you see in the field then is that they will just take that and, and translate it, interpret it into whatever language a child speaks. Well, the, the, the problem with that, going back to what we're talking about before, is that child may have never been exposed to that content in their native language, even if they're stronger in that native language, right? So then you give the assessment in English, right? And they score low. Well, is it because they're low because they're just in the process of acquiring English? Or do they score low because they really are having some sort of learning deficit? And that becomes tricky to sort out. Mm -hmm. Some of our coursework mm -hmm. from Dr. Megan has been about looking at um, our assessments mm -hmm. and determining if um, they're reliable when you look at the content validity and the time. Exactly. That's perfect. That's exactly right. It's the validity of the instrument. Am I measuring what I think I met, what the test was intended to measure? And oftentimes you're not when you interpret it because there's all sorts of error that's introduced into the measurement. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Okay. All right, and so overall, what you're trying to get at here is will the evaluation plan provide enough information gathered from multiple data sources in a culturally responsive manner over several sessions and across the child's natural settings for the team to make an informed and unbiased decision regarding the child's need for special education services? So that's the big idea behind developing these um, evaluation plans. And so when you're doing that for your assignment, really take this to heart and think about if you're developing an evaluation plan for a child, are you gathering enough information from multiple data sources, so not just one day of testing, um, over several sessions? So did I go into math class? Did I go into reading class? Did I look in the playground about how they're communicating? 
and the natural settings, again, within the school building, you have to think about what are some natural communicative contexts um, for you to make it informed. And this idea of unbiased is huge in special education law. We are supposed to be administering unbiased assessments and going through an unbiased assessment procedure, right? And the only way that you assure an unbiased process is by the team gathering multiple sources of data because the tests themselves are biased. There is bias inherent in them of the differences in terms of the content would be applied across cultures. And when you translate, um, the items aren't equivalent across languages. Okay. So the first um, step in special education evaluations with ELLs is often locating an interpreter, right? So if you do not share a language with a family or child, you may need to use an interpreter. So we're going to talk about interpretation here a bit before lunch. So how much time do I have before lunch? An hour. Okay. All right, I think we're going to do this sectionally. So interpreters versus translators. Technically speaking, translators translate written materials. Interpreters translate orally. That's the difference between those two terms. I know we use them interchangeably, but really technically that's the difference between the translator and an So challenges to professional interpretation. And this gets at some of our points that we were already bringing up. Individuals are hired who generally have no interpretation experience or training. We found someone else in the community that speaks Oromo. They're available at three o'clock. They're willing to work for hardly anything for two hours. <laughs> and you're on the team. You're coming and translating this meeting in Oromo. Um, in some communities, there may be only a few people who speak the required language, and it's hard to ensure confidentiality. So another huge part of our law in IDEA is confidentiality, right? And so it's important that the interpreter understands that they're not supposed to speak about anything in the community that happened during that meeting. And there are even forms um, that I've seen school, school districts use where they have them sign a confidentiality agreement. Um, and I can show you some of those maybe after lunch, I could pull them up on, online, um, where you have those forms right in the child's special education file so that you've assured that the interpreter is adhering or at least has committed to adhere to those rules. That's particularly important when there's small pockets of those speakers, right? So going back to my example in Mankato, there's only a handful of families that spoke Noor. They knew all the other Noor speakers in that community. You invited that Noor speaker there. That family may know that that person's a talker, or they may not want that person to really know about their child's disability. It's uncomfortable, right? And so they have the right to um, confidentiality within that setting. In different cultures, disability has different meanings, and families may be uncomfortable discussing sensitive issues with someone from their culture if they feel they will be judged, right? And so again, you have to be really sensitive to who you're bringing in as an interpreter and whether or not that family feels comfortable with that individual. So some ways to work around that is to let families know who will be the interpreter at the meeting, if they're comfortable with that person at the meeting, and if they have any concerns about that process. There are four common challenges in interpretation. This comes from an article by Greg Cheatham from the University of Kansas. So um, most of us in the field going into teaching, we didn't really, we don't really get training in working with interpreters, right? It's just something you think you're just, it's just like you're supposed to just go in there and know what to do, right? <laughs> um, but it's a complicated process and you also have to know what some of these errors that might occur in an interpreted um, setting. So there's addition errors, substitution errors, omission errors, and understanding interpreter roles and behaviors. We're going to start with addition errors. So interpreters may add information based on their own opinion or experience. How many have felt like you've been in that position where they're talking, 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 and you're not sure what they're talking about, but the family's attitude quickly changes, or you're really not sure what they're saying, and you're not sure how the, where the communication is happening, right? Again, going back to interpreters not having enough training, if they were certified interpreters at training, they would know that that's not their role to add their opinion or values. But if you have individuals who don't have that training, the potential comes up. So when I was in Minnesota, I've done lots of, I did a, led a center of excellence is what they called it, but basically did a lot of train the trainer for three years there. And every year I had the advocates, the statewide advocates come in from different communities. And one time the advocate came in from the Somali community and talked about how interpretive meetings across the state, and he had literally sat in hundreds of meetings over the decade that he'd worked for the State Department of Education that a lot of the Somali or many of the Somali interpreters in meetings he had been in where there were conflicts that the interpreter was adding their opinion to just say no because there was a big distrust of the government in the Somali community likely I mean they've been killed persecuted had to leave their flee their homes because of the danger associated with the government killing and persecuting its own people 
right? And so it was seen as a special education team coming in and judging the family, maybe taking the child away or saying there was some problem with that family. So it wasn't this idea, this broad level of disability, we're here to help you. It was, we are critiquing your parenting, we think there's something wrong, and there's a potential, there was something wrong with your child's development, and there's a lot of mistrust around that. So some Somali interpreter might add in those opinions and then sway the family to say no to services rather than really let the team say. Um, substitution errors. These types of errors occur when interpreters may not fully understand what they're asked to being interpret, right? A lot of the terminology we use in special education is complicated, like sensory impairments and even describing, you know, joint attention and what is autism. That doesn't translate across all languages. Not all languages have a term for autism or even have the construct of what that is and how it might be different from intellectual disability. So when you're thinking across languages and cultures, again, the reason it's important before you jump into these meetings with interpreters, it's important for them, for you to give them an opportunity to hear what you are going to need them to explain and to give them an opportunity for, to think through how they will explain that linguistically, what words will they use, and culturally, how will I communicate this construct or this idea to this family? Um, I mean, it's challenging enough to have these meetings in English with e English speaking families with the jargon and the, and the kinds of things that we talk about in special education, and then just add that whole other layer of the language difference and cultural differences. Okay, so um, that's another reason it's important to train your interpreter at a time. Omission errors, interpreters may leave out information for various reasons. One reason may be because simply the speaker spoke too long. It's really difficult in interpreter meetings to have some self-control, right? And just say a few sentences, allow the interpreter to speak. Say a few sentences, allow the interpreter to speak. You can't go on for five minutes and look at the interpreter and go, okay, it's your turn. <laughs> of course, there's gonna be a lot of things that left out because our working memory can only store so much information. We have limitations in that area. So when you're, when you're hosting an interpreted meeting, everyone should follow the same ground rules. Say a few sentences, let the interpreter speak. Say a few sentences, let the interpreter speak. Check frequently for comprehension of the family and not just asking a yes or no, like, did you understand? But asking, tell me what you understood so that you're making sure that the family has an opportunity to really, that, that you have an opportunity to check that family's comprehension of the material that's and all the content that's being communicated to them. Um, Another reason that an interpreter may omit things is that it may be uncomfortable for them to say what you just said, right? Culturally, they know how this family is going to feel about what you just said, and they are having difficulty for that message coming from them. And again, that goes back to really training and working with your interpreters being part of the team, and that they have to be aware and able to really say whatever the team is saying to the family without letting their own emotions get in the way of that interpretation. Um, interpreted meetings will take twice as long, so schedule two hours for them. By nature, you're saying everything twice. So you can't expect to do an interpreted meeting in an hour. It's so we have to have more flexibility in that area and schedule two hours, again, so that you have time to slow down, repeat, check for family comprehension, and that you're not rushing through this whole process to get it completed in an hour. Um, and understanding interpreter roles and behavior, the team should go over confidentiality, which I talked about. Remember, under the IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, if you're serving children with disabilities, families are absolutely entitled to full confidentiality. No side conversations on either end, and this means staff too. So having the self-control to not have conversations with a professional sitting next to you during interpreted meetings, but making sure that you're transparent and the family is also aware of everything that's said within that meeting. <clears throat> and then that's the last point there. So in thinking through this, um, right now, um, we, we already talked about a lot of this, that uh, interpreters should have linguistic and cultural knowledge, early childhood, or educa any education knowledge, interpretation practices, and we give them goals. How do you think are you, you're doing with interpreters that you work with, and what areas do you see as potential areas of improvement based on what we just discussed? Um, I know with our speech pathologist, she does a really um, fabulous job. Like she'll say, three or four sentences, stop, mm -hmm. looks at the translator. No. Interpreter. Interpreter. I, now I see, now, yeah. now I got my, whatever. <laughs> anyway, and then she she speaks, and then, then the parent communicates back, and then it's interpreted back. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't she doesn't speak like for five minutes, and right. her, she does her job. Yeah, it's nice to see that modeled appropriately, yeah. right? So that you have a good model of it. Mm -hmm. 
But one thing I that I lack though is if I don't know what they're saying, I do the side conversation like so like learn from that, like I need to speak up so yeah. everyone knows that I don't know what I'm talking about. Exactly. And chances are if you didn't understand, someone else in the room didn't understand either. So it's good to be really yeah, to ask for those clarifying points. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I gave you the language exposure evaluation report or the home language survey. Understanding a child's relative <coughs> proficiency in both languages helps us understand what to expect their performance to be in each language, right? You can only know as much language as you've been exposed to. And so that's the point of um, completing. So that's the point of completing this home language survey is to figure out how much of each language they know. Now in your school districts, I'm fairly certain you probably have some question at the beginning of the year that says, do you speak a language other than English at home? And there's a checkbox for that, which kind of probably leads down um, for ESL services or doing ESL evaluations. But this is meant to get a bit more in detail about how much of each language they're exposed to at home um, so that you can figure out, um, again, what you would expect their level of performance to be. So, um, so here, the way that this one was designed, and you might think about this differently with school age population so you can see whether or not it fits, but the idea here is that Monday through Friday and Saturday through Sunday, there are different language environments, right? So usually during the week, these kids are in school, and so we designed this to capture like the morning routine, then going to school early afternoon, mid-afternoon, again, we designed this with early childhood in mind where they might be in just a half-day program, and then evening to bedtime what languages are being used. We divided this into what language does your child hear and then what language do they speak, right? Because as kids progress to English only environments, we often find that even though they're hearing their home language, they might be choosing to use English in their home environment, even if their family is speaking to them in Spanish. So um, we have Monday through Friday, Saturday through Sunday, what do they hear? And then we have um, the same setup for what do they speak. Right, based on those times. So then you have a family complete that, and then you look over the um, the intervals or the amount of times that they used to be Spanish, English, or both being used. If there are other languages there, that you can feel free to add another box in there. You could add other so that families can support other languages. That they Once you have that information, you can think about children and think about maybe three broad categories of language proficiency groups. <clears throat> You'll have children that are home language dominant, so essentially they're way on in terms of what's completed here, it's heavy on the Spanish, right, or whatever the home language is. There are kids that might be more like balanced bilinguals, where it seems like both are being used most of the time, or there are children who might even be more English dominant, where they might be getting some home language exposure maybe on the weekends, but mostly during other times they're really being exposed to English. When we ran analyses, what's interesting on this form, um, this was given to over 900 kids across the course of our study, and we ran some analyses that looked at which items on this actually predicted performance in English and Spanish most. It was actually their weekend responses that predicted how well they performed in English and Spanish on assessment. So it was really the influence of the family in the home. And again, our population was three to five-year-olds. Um, <clears throat> but in looking at this, it really was that home language experience that was predicting their performance both in English and Spanish. So this is a little bit more about your culminating project. Um, I'm going to introduce this idea here and probably have to send a few follow-up materials because we were brainstorming a bit about what would be more meaningful um, based on the roles that you play in schools and the kinds of experiences that you have. So uh, what we're going to do is if, if there's going to be a slight change in what is required for your culminating project, you'll choose a student who's an EL and have their family complete one of these home language surveys on them, which I know some of you have already done. Then you're going to find the assessment, in, oh, I forgot, no, you're going to develop a child profile and have that whole point. Then you'll find the assessment information that is available for that student and discuss how you would interpret his or her performance based on their language exposure. So like Ames Web, do, do you have Ames Web yeah. data? Yeah, that's an assessment and you would have access to that. So say they scored low on their Ames Web, but you get this back and it's mostly Spanish here. So that would be why, right? That would be one reason why is that potentially they're exposed to more Spanish, they were assessed in kindergarten in English, and so that might be why they had lower performance on the AIMS web. Um, and then you're gonna provide three strategies you would use to differentiate instruction for that student. We were also talking about across content areas. 
And so it will uh, be giving you more detail on that, but I want to set up what you expected to do. Project. So is this in the PowerPoint? No, this is a new slide. And so oh, okay. we, yeah, there's a few new things I added during lunchtime that you'll see here. So I'll, I'll, let me just jump in because I'm going to be the one that follows up on this. So this yeah. is your evaluation plan that's in your seminar um, on the, in the rubric. And so we were just brainstorming at lunch about some shifts and some changes that we wanted to make. Um, so that's why it's not in your PowerPoint. So I will follow up and so will Dr. Scott and it will be in, in webcam. Okay. So say you received that this is actually one of the um, questionnaires that I received back from the students and you get this profile, right? So um, the father completed this. Um, what language do you use when you talk to your child? They use both. What language do other people use at home? Spanish. Uh, what language does your child use when talking at home? They use both. What language is your most comfortable now? Your child most comfortable with now? English. This father reports from the ages of zero to one. Was there English, Spanish, or both? There was both being spoken. Um, does your child know any of the language in addition to English and Spanish? No. Do they have an IEP? No. Um, so this is the information that's at the front end of this. So really, this is already creating a profile where this child has two native languages, both English and Spanish. They are, is this child a simultaneous or sequential bilingual? Simultaneous, right? Right there, from the ages of zero to one, they were exposed to both, right? And it looks like they're exposed to um, both right now. Uh, then I also have the grade, I don't know what happened to it. Oh, here it is. This is one. So, and so this is the grid part. When you look at what they, do they hear and what, um, what are they speaking, you see across that it's mostly both or English, and it looks like English is used during the school times, right, from nine to four. So it looks like at home they're using both, but primarily at school they're hearing English. If you look early afternoon, mid afternoon English, and what are they speaking English during those same blocks of time? Okay. So if I were to think about a pro child profile, his name is Child Maritza. She's a balanced bilingual, a simultaneous bilingual. Her home exposure, Maritza's family speaks both Spanish and English at home, and both of her parents were born in the U.S. Maritza was exposed to both languages from birth, and she's a simultaneous bilingual. At school, she's exposed to English and is using primarily English in school. The classroom exposure is English-only instruction. So how would you interpret her assessment data? You could look at the Ames web, Meta scores, just whatever you have access to as a general education teacher. I don't know, is there any other assessment info that you might have access to? Map data. Map data, okay, good. SBAC, what grade was it? It just depends whatever grade, you're gonna do this on a child in your setting, so whatever. You teach and you whatever data you have access to. Okay, so she would if you were third grade, then you have that other. So I can't know exactly everything that you have access to, but you would put here what you what you have access to, and then how and answer this question: How might her performance on the assessments be affected by her language background? Does everyone understand what the assignment will be? Do you have ideas in terms of assessments that are available to you? All the ones that she listed up there, including that as well. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Then the instructional recommendations will be based again on your grade level, and I'm going to give you more detail and a different example for this. I have to think through a school age example for this, and I couldn't quite do that to finish all up during lunch, but I'll make sure I'll work with you, Tracy, and make sure we have a good example. Um, but say the classroom was English only, teachers should focus on building novel and academic vocabulary and pre-academic skills in English through rich and varied learning opportunities, practices such as dialogical book reading, incul incorporating culturally relevant themes, and language scaffolding strategies should be used. The family should be supported in engaging in shared book reading and poem as well as storytelling and family discussions to include the likelihood oops, that Marita will maintain the book development trajectory in, or in Spanish. Um, if you were in a bilingual setting, then there are some there's some recommendations there that she could be having high quality teaching uh, lessons in both languages, right? Because she is learning both. Okay, maybe a little confused, but we're doing this on our students. Yes. Correct. Okay. 
Yes. And so I'm just giving an example of some of the strategies that I would recommend. And this is an early childhood example, but you will give grade level examples. Gotcha. And so I need to develop a grade uh, elementary school example. Okay. All right. So that's just a that's a little preview of your culminating project and how it shifted a little bit, but it summarizes what we've been talking about this morning and then how it will play into your culminating project and how this form will inform your development for the project. Okay. Okay. So some of the family's views on child's home language. Immigrant parents can feel divided sometimes between their desire for the child to learn the home language as well as their desire to want them to succeed in the U.S. and be fully proficient speakers of English. And while um, families sometimes hear the message that it's an either or, it's really fit. Uh, children can do both, right? They can be fully proficient speakers of their home language and acquire English and master English at, with a high level of competency. So families don't have to choose between using their home language and their child learning English. Their child by nature will learn both. And I think just families need to hear more of that message in, to help them understand the value of their home language and how important it is. All right, so let's think about, let's do a little activity now. So I want you to think if you have one of these home language surveys completed, um, you can think about what, what, where would you put that child in terms of the groups? Remember there was home language dominant, balanced by lingual or English dominant based on the information that you gathered. What category would you put them in? If you don't want to have one completed, can you think of a child that you currently work with that you might estimate where they might be in terms of those categories? Um, so then you'll just think about the child profile a bit. So remember back on the slide, I had a little, a little uh, example of a child profile of what language she speaks, whether she's a simultaneous or he or she's a simultaneous or sequential bilingual. So write a little paragraph about that child and a little practice doing that. <clears throat> and then what performance would you expect in each language? Based on their background, what performance might you expect in each language? So that's just a little activity for you to go through now. Does everyone have an idea, either child that they work with or form that they have completed? If not, I have a few of these sample forms and I can just pass them out and you can work off of one that's a sample. 